So starting with roles, um, these are the most common machine learning roles that we see um, in you know uh, these days, right? So you have machine learning product managers, you have DevOps, you have data engineers, you have ML engineers, ML researchers, and data scientists, right? Um, all of these are roles that you might see on a machine learning team. And so the question is like, what's even the difference between all of these things? Um, so I'm going to try to break down sort of the job function for each of these roles. So machine learning product manager, um, this is a relatively new role. Um, and this is actually the first time I've included it in this slide. But um, machine learning product managers, their job is to work with the ML team, but also um, the business and the users and the data owners. And their goal is really to prioritize projects and then make sure that the projects are executed according to their requirements. So it's just like a regular product manager, but in the context of machine learning organizations, which introduces some unique challenges. Um, and so product managers are working with you know, design docs, wireframes, work plans, and um, operating in project management software, often like JIRA. Then you have DevOps engineers. And so the role of the DevOps engineer is to deploy and monitor a system into production. And so their work product, like the, the end product of their work, is a model that's actually deployed into production. And so they're using kind of often the AWS suite of tools to do that. Data engineers are focused on building data pipelines. So um, you know, uh, storing data, aggregating it, monitoring it, building features on top of it, and helping stream it into the machine learning team's workflow. Um, and so their work product often looks like a, something like a Hadoop distributed system. Then you have machine learning engineers. And so machine learning engineer is a pretty broad role that encompasses most of the training and deployment um, lifecycle. And so in a lot of organizations, machine learning engineers are responsible for um, you know, training prediction models and then um, deploying them all the way into production. And so usually the work product of an ML engineer looks like a prediction, prediction system that's actually running um, in the real world. Then there's ML researchers. And I think the distinction between ML researcher and ML engineer um, is getting a little bit fuzzier. But um, ML researchers typically are only doing the training prediction model piece. And um, a lot of times, they're doing it in sort of more of a, a research context, like a context for more forward-looking problems. And their models, um, you know, either they'll hand them off to someone to productionize, or they'll be working on stuff that's so forward-looking that it'll never be productionized at all. And then finally, there's this, um, this role called like data scientist. right? And so this is, this is actually just like a blanket term that really can be used to describe any of the roles. Um, that, that we've already talked about, and in addition to like many other things. Um, so you know, in many organizations, a data scientist is um, really just sort of answering questions that the business has using analytics um, and using data to do that. So this data scientist is sort of a catch-all term. So what are the skills that you need to actually succeed in each of these roles? Um, so on this chart, I plotted the level of machine learning sort of knowledge and skill that you need along the x-axis. And then along the y-axis um, uh, uh, is the level of engineering skill that you need. And so, um, you know, and, the, and so then the size of the bubble is kind of how much communication and technical writing skill is usually required. So for ML DevOps, um, this is really essentially a software engineering role. And so you know, these folks often come into machine learning teams from a typical software engineering um, pipeline. And a lot of times they you know, really don't have any machine learning experience at all. Um, but if you're a really strong software engineer, this can be a good entry point into the machine learning world. Um, data engineers tend to work more actively with machine learning team as a customer, um, because the output of their workflow is a data pipeline that is then used by the ML team. And so these folks usually have at least some sort of affinity with machine learning, you know, maybe they've studied, maybe they've taken one class on it, and they're, they're uh, very close to the concepts. Um, ML engineer, um, again, is sort of a, a very rare skill set, right? So this is, these are folks that have a mix of machine learning skills, um, so they can train models in TensorFlow, um, and they also have software engineering skills. So where do you actually find people that have both of those skill sets? Often these are, you know, software engineers who have invested a bunch of time on their own into self-teaching. Um, self-teaching and machine learning. So that's kind of where a lot of these folks come from. Um, you'll often, 
also see these as sort of people who did ML adjacent PhDs, like PhDs in the sciences or in statistics even, who then went on to work as software engineers. Um, so they're you know, really familiar with the core concepts of machine learning, they know how to train models, and then they've built the software engineering um, uh, skill set on top of that. ML researchers, so these are your ML experts, and this is kind of the one role that I think um, typically still has a PhD, um, but often they're also, you know, sometimes there are people who have a master's degree or, you know, they did some, one of the industrial fellowship programs, like they did, they were a um, Google Brain resident or something along those lines. Um, and so the, these folks, you know, generally they are ML experts, but they're not expected to have a ton of software en engineering expertise. Then you have your data scientists. Um, and so again, this is a catch-all term. So really this is a wide range of backgrounds, but one interesting background that um, I've seen as a trend here is that there are a lot of people who um, either went into one of these new programs that focus on training people in data science, like did a data science master's or studied data science as an undergrad, or they did kind of um, a science PhD in you know, um, geology or something like that, and then learned the data science skill set on top of that. Um, one thing I think that's worth mentioning here is that oftentimes one of the success factors for data scientists is having a really high degree of um, communication and technical writing skills. And that's because oftentimes a lot of what the data, what data science uh, scientists are providing to the organization is sort of reports and charts and um, you know, tools to help leaders make decisions. Right? And so being able to communicate the findings that you have um, in the data is really important to do well in this role a lot of times. And then lastly, MLPMs. And so I think um, you know, these are typically just traditional product managers, but people who have, again, invested a lot of time into understanding the ML development process and the ML development mindset. OK, I'll stop here and take any questions about sort of machine learning roles. One question is, who is in charge of data labeling quality control predictions? Uh, so who's in charge of data labeling? Well, who's in charge of quality control predictions was the question, but quality control could be for data labeling or for predictions. I see. Um, so I think data labeling, there's sort of a difference of, of opinions about where this, should, um, where this should live. I think that what I've seen a lot of organizations that do a lot of data, data labeling converge on is that data labeling becomes part of the machine learning function. And we'll talk more about this when we talk about um, ML orgs. But um, uh, I think you know, ultimately, since the machine learning engineers are the ones that are consuming the labels, um, and they're the ones who are responsible for making a good prediction model, um, it makes sense for that team to also own making sure that the, the data that they train their models on is of high quality. But obviously, in some organizations where you know, the ML team is consuming data that comes from another function, that might be impossible. Um, but I think it's. Um, in an ideal state, the machine learning team, like one of actually their main work products is um, having really high quality labeled data sets. Well, uh, how many of each role should exist in the team? Um, there's no sort of one answer to that. It just depends a lot on the specifics of your problem. Yeah, I think, um, and uh, I'll, I'll touch a little bit on how, how some teams approach this. People call out that there should also be potentially a data infrastructure engineer or a machine learning infrastructure engineer. I think that's probably covered under data engineer and ML engineer. Yeah, that's true. Although there's often um, one thing that I've seen more recently is that um, some ML teams have like what I would call like a full stack engineer who is responsible for building internal tooling. Um, I think a lot of ML teams are starting to realize that it's important to invest in tooling, and um, not all of the right tooling for ML exists um, you know, from third parties at this point. And so I, that, that is something that I'm seeing that I've heard more recently. There's, there were two questions in the first lecture. Is there a methodological approach to combine the development tasks in a sprint-oriented pipeline? And is there a recommended methodology like Scrum for ML project management? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I think that there should be an equivalent to Scrum for ML product management, um, but it does not exist yet. And um, so, you know, I think hopefully um, what you can come away with this weekend from is a little bit of like a rough sense of how um, 
of how you might adapt sort of DevOps or Scrum to an ML setting. Um, but I think the, you know, the book on this is waiting to be written. If you're building ML capability from scratch, what role should you start with? That's a great question. Um, I think it depends on what you want to do, right? So if you're like really passionate about building stuff and you know, seeing, the, um, seeing you know, your work turn into a tool that gets used by a lot of people, then I would just start with software engineering, right? I think software engineering is super useful in machine learning teams. And if you're a software engineer who also sort of gets machine learning and you at a high level know how to train models and you understand you know, the stuff that we've taught in this class, then I think that a lot of machine learning teams will want to have you on board to help um, sort of build you know, deployment pipelines and training pipelines and internal tooling. Um, yeah. The question might be slightly different. It's like a company starting machine learning what's the first role they should get? Hmm. Um, yeah, I think the way that most companies start um, approaching machine learning, at least most big companies, is they'll hire a couple of researchers and stick them in the R&D group. Um, I'll talk more about this in a little bit, but um, I think probably a better way to do it is to try to hire people who are more, um, a little bit more towards full stack, like who can train models, but also um, in, like, get closer to deploying those models into production, and then embed them with the product teams. Yeah, I would second that, because uh, most of the time, there's a cool document that's called Rules of Machine Learning, I think, or Rules for Machine Learning from Google. And uh, like an 80% solution might be very simple logistic regression. And if you can deploy that in production, that's going to add value to your users like 80% as much as the most complicated model you can develop. So if you can ship that first and instrument the whole thing, then you can hire ML scientists to improve the model, but the rest of the thing will be in place already. Agreed. Uh, you wanna do another one? Yeah, let's do one more. So this one's about ML research. Is it a must to have a PhD for ML research? Um, so it's definitely not a must to have a PhD to do ML research. Um, I think the most straightforward path, other than doing a PhD, is to go and do um, you know, the Google Brain residency or the Facebook AI residency or um, the OpenAI Fellowship or one of those programs that, um, where you can go embed in a research organization. Um, I think one of the hard things about research is that it's a very, um, it's a, it's a very sort of mentorship-driven field. And um, I think like one of the reasons that PhDs still exist and operate the way that they do is because um, doing a PhD allows you to essentially be an apprentice to um, you know, a world-class researcher for you know, four to six years. And it's relatively hard to find opportunities to do that um, outside of the PhD. Um, but I think to, to become like a sort of, if your goal is to become an independent researcher who can sort of conceive of and execute projects from beginning to end, um, I think the PhD is still the best way to learn how to do that though it's not um, by any means necessary. There's a couple of other good questions. Yeah, sure, that. let's do it. So one is, what is a core skill for all of these roles? <laughs> I, th <laughs> I think a core skill for all of these roles is um, you, have to like, you have to sort of conceptually get machine learning and what makes it different than, um, than typical software engineering, right? So I think it's a lot of what we're talking about this weekend. Um, right, like you have to sort of understand that machine learning models are not going to work 100% of the time. Um, you have to understand the types of things that make them fail, right? Like having data that's not in, in your training distribution. Um, and you have to understand that executing on machine learning projects is there's never a guarantee. And there's never, you know, you can never really say definitively that this project will take two weeks because, um, you know, you don't really know um, how difficult or your data is or not until you've actually gotten tried things on it. So I think if you grasp that mindset, then you know, there's a balance of other skills that you can have to complement it, whether it's being a really good PM or being a really good engineer or you know, really understanding the state of the art and knowing how to implement um, and answer research questions. So I think, but I think that mindset is sort of the core thing that underlies all this. And then last one, since a lot of these roles are new, what, how, do sh how should candidates think about career progression? Yeah, it's a good question. Um,
Yeah, I, I actually don't have a good answer to that. I mean, I think, um, you know, maybe, like, let's take how you think about career progression in software engineering, for example, right? Like, I think um, typically the way that people think about career progression in software engineering is, you know, in some organizations you can become more and more senior as an individual contributor and just stay on that track forever if you want to. Um, and uh, so I think in those same organizations, then usually there's an ML individual contributor track. And so you can just become more and more of an expert in your niche and um, keep building, like keep moving forward in that way. Um, in a lot of other organizations, that doesn't really exist. And so then the way that people progress is by becoming managers. Um, and I think that there's less of an equivalent right now for that in machine learning because you know, machine learning is still in early days in uh, most companies. And so I think, you know, um, you can, there's, I think that there's going to be more opportunities to progress into like ML management and ML leadership roles going forward, especially if you've sort of already proven that you understand this stuff really deeply. So yeah, it's a bit of a non-answer, but I think that's how I would think about it. Yeah, I think it's also possible to, because these things are adjacent to each other, so it's possible that you start just doing machine learning science, but then you get really interested in data infrastructure. And that actually one of the speakers uh, from last year, Jay from uh, Uber, he was saying it's easy for him to find data scientists now, but it's very hard for him to find good data engineers. And so he, he was encouraging all of, you know, the equivalent of you a year ago to like be data engineers instead of machine learning scientists. So if you find that interesting, that could be a path. Great.